U.S. Agriculture Secretary met Governor Abbott today to announce steps to battle an invasive species that could threaten Texas livestock. For 30 years, the United States fought one of the strangest wars ever recorded. It wasn't against another country or an army. It was against ants. Across the southern states, helicopters and drones filled the skies, dropping millions of tiny killer flies onto fire ant colonies below. 300 million additional sterile flies, in addition to what we're already producing in Panama and Mexico, to eradicate and control this forever. Inside secret government labs, Scientists spent billions of dollars breeding special flies designed to turn ants into living zombies. Their goal was simple, wipe out the fire ants that had invaded and spread across America. But nature never surrenders easily. What happened next didn't just surprise the experts, it left them speechless. The flies worked exactly as planned, yet the ants fought back in a way that no one could have imagined. Their shocking twist changed everything scientists thought they knew about controlling nature the silent invasion that sets the stage. In the early 20th century, a small army arrived on U.S. soil and nobody noticed until it was too late. Hidden in the soil ballast of cargo ships coming from South America, fire ant colonies slipped into Mobile, Alabama. Over time, they spilled off those ships and into the surrounding landscape. These insects came from tropical lands where they fought for survival every day. Back home, birds, insects, and predators kept them in check. But in their new world, they found a paradise. Warm weather, abundant food sources, and almost no natural enemies. Without competition or threats, they multiplied rapidly. A single colony could grow into an underground metropolis of hundreds of thousands of ants. Their nests sprawled across pastures, parks, yards, fields, and even golf courses. By mid-century, their presence was undeniable. Wherever the ground was disturbed, mounds appeared. Farmers, homeowners, and city planners all began to see the signs. Fire ants were no longer just pests, they were invaders. Their advance was relentless. In the decades that followed, their territory stretched across multiple states. They invaded new regions via flooded rivers, by hitchhiking in soil on trucks and nursery plants, and by rescue queens flying off to start new colonies miles away. Soon, the fire ants were everywhere, and to fight them, Scientists would have to match their cunning, not with more poison, but with a weapon stranger than any had ever seen, when ants became America's greatest threat. By the time the 20th century turned into its second half, fire ants were no longer just pests. They had become a full-blown crisis. These tiny invaders had spread across 350 million acres of American land, costing the country billions of dollars each year in damage, medical costs, and failed control efforts. They invaded lawns, fields, parks, and pastures. In some areas, you might find hundreds of ant nests per acre. Their colonies ran deep underground with many queens. So killing one nest would often just spark another in its place. People began to suffer. The ants bit and stung. They destroyed crops, killed livestock, and invaded electrical gear. In Texas alone, any damage to wiring and traffic systems reaches millions of dollars yearly. Local strategies failed. Pesticides worked briefly. Flooding nests sometimes backfire. Physical attacks only stirred the ants into spreading faster. The ants even locked their jaws and legs together to float through floodwaters and escape. Faced with this, scientists realized a new idea was needed. They looked back to South America, to the ants' native land, searching for the one enemy the fire ants could not escape. That enemy turned out to be decapitating flies, but unleashing them would be the greatest gamble in the history of pest control. The head-chopping flies. Deep in the rainforests of South America lives one of nature's strangest and most unsettling killers. Scientists call them forid flies, but they are better known by a far scarier name, decapitating flies. For millions of years, these tiny parasites have been locked in battle with fire ants. Over that time, nature shaped them into some of the most efficient hunters on Earth. There are more than 4,000 species of forid flies, but only about 70 are true ant decapitators. The way they hunt is both fascinating and horrifying. After mating, a female fly takes off on a deadly mission. She searches for fire ants with the accuracy of a guided missile. When she spots one, she dives down and in less than a second, uses a sharp, needle-like tube to inject a single egg inside the ant's body. The ant doesn't even realize what just happened. It goes on working, carrying food, digging tunnels, and tending to the colony unaware that something deadly is growing inside. Within a day, that egg hatches into a tiny larva. 
Hungry and unstoppable, it begins to eat the ant from the inside out. At first, it feeds gently, sipping the ant's blood-like fluid called hemolymph. The ant still acts normal. It continues to move, to work, to serve. But as the days pass, the larva grows stronger and hungrier. It slowly crawls upward, making its way to the ant's head. Once it reaches the brain, the horror begins. The larva starts eating the brain tissue and the muscles that control the jaws. The ant is still alive, but no longer in control. Its body moves, but its mind is gone. For a short time, it becomes a living puppet, a zombie ant controlled by the parasite inside. Then comes the gruesome end. The larva releases special chemicals that dissolve the connection between the ant's head and body. With a small, sickening snap, the head falls off. Inside that hollow shell, the larva finishes its final transformation, turning into a new adult fly. It crawls out and takes to the air, ready to find another victim and start the process all over again. Even more incredible, these flies have one target only, fire ants. They ignore all other insects and animals, as if they have a built-in radar tuned only to their ancient enemy. When scientists in the United States discovered these flies, they were amazed. After years of searching for a natural solution to the fire ant invasion, they had finally found nature's perfect weapon, a creature that had spent millions of years learning how to kill their enemy. But finding the flies was only the beginning. If America wanted to use them as a national defense against fire ants, they would need something bigger than just experiments. They would need to build an entire factory, a place where armies of these tiny assassins could be bred for war. The secret laboratory, Hidden in Gainesville, Florida sits one of the oddest labs you will ever hear about. From the outside, it looks like any government building. But inside, scientists were running what felt more like a tiny insect army. For the fire ant war, they built a full-scale factory for forid flies, the decapitating fly. The United States Department of Agriculture led the work, and the program grew from small tests in the late 1990s into mass rearing by the turn of the century. Walking into that lab was like stepping into another world. Shelf after shelf held special boxes. Each one kept at exact temperatures and humidity so the flies and their ant hosts would thrive. Inside those boxes, the same strange hunt that plays out in South American forests was staged over and over. Scientists kept fire ants in trays and forced them to move their brood again and again. The constant panic sent out alarm pheromones, and those smells were like a dinner bell to the flies. The stronger the alarm, the faster the flies zeroed in. Each morning, fresh flies went into attack chambers where they had only a few days to hunt and lay their eggs. When that cycle ended, the surviving ants were removed and new ants were brought in. It was a brutal, efficient loop of panic, attraction, infection, and more panic. Week after week, the process produced thousands of ants carrying fly larvae, and then thousands of new flies. When it was time to ship these tiny soldiers into the field, the work got almost mechanical. Scientists guided the flies toward bright lights so they fell into traps, then packed them into clear plastic tubes about the size of a pencil. Each tube held roughly 300 to 400 flies, and those tubes went into coolers for the trip to release sites. What began as a trickle of a few hundred or a few thousand flies grew into organized releases across states, part of a national push to let nature itself fight an invading pest. The strategy worked enough to establish several fly species in the United States. Over time, six forid fly species from South America were released and became part of the landscape in many fire ant areas. The lab in Gainesville was not a hobby project. It was the engine behind a deliberate plan to let a natural enemy do what chemicals and machines had failed to do alone. Would this factory be the key to turning the tide, or would it only change how the battle was fought? The answer would come slowly, and it would surprise even the people running the lab. When the sky rained flies, when the scientists were finally ready to take their work into the real world, it looked more like a movie than an experiment. Trucks and vans rolled out carrying coolers packed with thousands of forid flies, each one a living weapon in America's strangest war. The teams drove deep into fields, farms, and open land where fire ant mounds covered the ground like craters on a battlefield. Once there, they began what they called colony disruption. Using shovels, rakes, and their own boots, they tore open the mounds and flipped the soil. Instantly, the ants swarmed out out, flooding over the dirt in a wave of fury. 
They rushed to defend their home, carrying their white larvae and eggs to safety, releasing alarm pheromones that filled the air with the scent of panic. That smell was exactly what the scientists wanted. Those pheromones worked like a beacon for the flies. The moment the air filled with the ants' alarm, the scientists opened the tubes and released hundreds, sometimes thousands, of flies into the air. The insects lifted off like tiny fighter planes, darting through the chaos and locking onto their targets with pinpoint accuracy. Each fly swooped down, stabbed an ant, and injected an egg in less than a second. Within moments, hundreds of ants were infected, each carrying a silent killer inside. The battle wasn't over in a single strike, though. Scientists knew that one attack wasn't enough. Over the next few weeks, they returned again and again, releasing new waves of flies to keep the pressure on. In some experiments, the researchers tried something clever. They took infected ants back to the lab, let the fly larvae grow a little inside, then returned those same ants to their colony. These Trojan horse ants spread the parasites from within, turning the colony against itself. Timing was everything. The scientists had to wait for the right weather. No strong winds, no heavy rain, because the flies were fragile. A single bad day could ruin the mission. Each release was logged, tracked, and studied like a military operation. They mapped out which colonies had been attacked, how the ants behaved afterward, and how many flies survived to start again. Week by week, the process became more refined. What started as a small field test evolved into a national campaign. Across several states, millions of flies were released into the skies. Each swarm was a weapon of nature, guided not by machines but by instinct. But as the years went on, the scientists noticed something strange. The ants weren't just dying, they were changing. And what happened next would rewrite everything scientists thought they knew about controlling the natural world. The shocking results. After years of releasing millions of flies across the southern United States, scientists expected to see the fire ants finally fall. The plan had worked perfectly in the lab. The flies infected the ants, spread quickly, and built stable populations in the wild. By every scientific measure, it looked like a success. But when the results came in, they shocked everyone. The fire ants hadn't just survived. They had changed. Colonies that once swarmed fearlessly began to hesitate. Worker ants that used to charge straight into battle now froze the moment they sensed flies nearby. They started abandoning food, stopping their raids, and hiding underground. Entire colonies would shut down their foraging for hours whenever a fly buzzed overhead. The flies weren't just killing ants anymore, they were changing how the ants thought, acted, and lived. In some areas, scientists noticed a strange pattern. Fire ants were no longer building their nests in open fields where the flies hunted easily. Instead, they began shifting to shaded areas, under trees or inside cracks where flies had trouble finding them. It was as if the ants Ants were learning. By the mid-2000s, researchers realized the flies had done something unexpected. They had turned the war into psychological warfare. Even when the flies weren't attacking, the ants acted as if they were. They became cautious, slow, and defensive, behavior no one had ever seen before. Surveys showed that in regions where decapitating flies were established, fire ant worker populations dropped by about 15 percent. That might not sound like much, but in a colony of hundreds of thousands, it was huge. Fewer workers meant less food collection, lower growth and fewer new queens. The flies had permanently changed how the fire ants behaved and how their colonies survived. Even more amazing, the flies didn't just survive in America, they thrived. Within a few years, they spread far beyond the areas where scientists first released them. By 2011, the decapitating flies had been found in nearly 90% of fire ant territory. They had adapted perfectly to their new home. At first, this looked like victory. Nature had finally found balance. But deep down, scientists began to realized that something else was happening, something the data didn't show yet. The flies had changed the ants' behavior, yes, but the ants were far from defeated. They were preparing for something even more surprising, a comeback no one saw coming. The war takes to the skies. Once the flies had proven themselves in the lab and field tests, the battle took off, literally. The war against fire ants expanded beyond insect warfare into the skies, unleashing new tools, new tactics, and new surprises. Helicopters appeared overhead, not carrying soldiers, but tiny grains of poison bait. These baits looked harmless, small bits of mulch or food laced with slow-acting poison. Fire ants would collect them and bring them back into their nests, unknowingly delivering death to their own colonies. In rugged or remote terrain, 
Ukraine, helicopters were the only way to reach infested lands fast and spread the bait widely. Soon, drones joined the fight. These unmanned aircraft could dip low, hover over delicate zones, and drop bait precisely where needed, with less cost and greater flexibility than helicopters. In recent years, drone technology has become one of the most powerful weapons in fire ant control programs globally. On the ground, scientists also employed specially trained dogs. These sniffer dogs could detect the scent of fire ant colonies from many feet away. Teams of dogs and handlers would walk through areas, sniffing out hidden nests that even the best bait or fly attack might miss. Together, flies, drones, helicopters, bait, and dogs formed a force unlike anything nature or science had ever attempted before. As the aerial campaigns expanded, fire ant range continued to grow in many places. In Australia, for instance, drones and helicopters are now standard tools used to treat properties larger than five hectares as part of national eradication efforts. Still, even this high-tech escalation could not wipe the ants out. The battle lines shifted, the tactics evolved, and a new truth began to emerge. This war was more than a battle of tools. It was a war of adaptation, the ultimate revelation. After more than 30 years of research, field tests, and millions of flies released into the wild, the truth that finally emerged shocked everyone. The United States had not won the war against fire ants. Nature had. The decapitating flies had done their job perfectly. They spread across the southern states, establishing permanent populations in almost every region where fire ants lived. They changed how the ants behaved, turning once fearless swarms into cautious, nervous colonies. Worker ants hid underground for longer, foraged less, and abandoned open ground whenever a fly appeared. Scientists achieved exactly what they set out to do, but the ants adapted faster than anyone imagined. They learned to avoid areas where flies were most active. They changed their daily schedules, foraging at different hours to escape attack. Some colonies even developed subtle defensive behaviors, keeping watch for the flies and protecting their queens more carefully. And then there was the one advantage no technology could match, reproduction. Fire ants reproduce at a staggering rate. Several times a year, millions of young queens take flight, starting new colonies wherever they land. Even if 15% of workers were lost to flies, the remaining ants quickly replaced them. For every mound destroyed, dozens more would rise somewhere else. By the time researchers counted the results, the fire ants had taken over more land than ever before, more than 340 million acres stretching across the southern United United States. The helicopters, drones, poison baits, sniffer dogs, and decapitating flies had slowed them down, but not stopped them. It was the perfect paradox. The project was a success by every scientific measure, yet the ants still won. The flies had survived, the ants had adapted, and the war had reached a strange kind of balance. Neither side could destroy the other. Today, the decapitating flies still hover over the fields and pastures of the American South, while fire ants continue to build their towers of red earth below. They are are locked in a living stalemate, a reminder that in the battle between human science and nature's resilience, there is rarely such a thing as total victory. So what do you think? Should we keep using nature to fight nature? Or is there a limit to how much we should interfere? Because if the fire ant war has taught us anything, it's that nature always finds a way to fight back. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.